Member Vancouver Fairview. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. Last week, the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change issued one of its seven-year reports. This was a three-year joint effort that involved more than 300 scientists. Among the comments in the report are that the volume of scientific literature on the effects of climate change has doubled since our last report. The summary of the report mentioned the word risk more than 230 times. That's six times more than the last report seven years ago. In the words of a leading scientist, there is the potential for crossing a threshold that leads to large system changes, and that's a very unknown world. The report went on to say that in tandem with poverty and inequality, climate change poses a much more direct threat to both life and livelihood. Honourable Speaker, it's common in this House for us to strive to be hopeful. In fact, it's common for all politicians to strive in our exchanges with the public to be hopeful. It's the easiest approach to take. It's what wins us friends. But as leaders, and in this chamber, we need to be honest with each other, and we need to be honest with the public. We need to look beyond simple messaging if we are to create hopeful solutions to the issues and problems that face us. I don't need to go through the long litany of effects of climate change that potentially face us because we already know what many of them look like. Many of them are he here today. We've seen wildfires in Australia. We've seen heat waves in Europe and across the United States. We hear about the acidification of the oceans killing the coral reefs. And we need look no further than here in British Columbia, where in February we had a massive die-off of scallops and oysters, a significant impact, impact on our aquaculture industry. 80 to 90 percent of the crop on the south coast died off as a result of ocean acidification. Last July was the driest in 60 years, followed by flooding in southeast BC and Calgary. And of course, we know about the effect of the pine beetle on our forests. The UN report went on to say that governments do not have adequate systems in place to protect populations, particularly the poorest, the weakest, the most elderly, who are, of course, the most under threat, as are low-lying island nations, nations that depend on a subsistence fishery to feed themselves. But that is true here as well. We are told that food prices are projected to rise worldwide, and we've seen the effect of food price shocks in the riots that have occurred recently in both Asia and Africa. As an author of the report said, we need yields to grow to meet growing demand, but already climate change is slowing those yields. For us here in BC, not just to feed our own population, but to assist in feeding people around the world, we need to protect agricultural land. We need to understand that as climate changes and growing zones shift northward, we need to be aware of not just our needs today, not just what land is used for for agriculture today, but what it will be used for in the future, what it will be needed for in the future, what it will be absolutely necessary for in the future. Today, on the steps of the legislature, farmers of British Columbia came to talk to all of us, specifically the government, but to all of us about the impacts of considerations we may make in this House and how important it is that they, as farmers, as the people who devote their lives to feeding us and others around the world, need to be consulted about the impact of plans that are made for our agricultural land. All of this has a cost, Honourable Speaker. The failure to address the impacts of climate change, the failure to plan for the future, has a cost, an economic cost. It's not simply a question of choosing the environment or the economy today. The UN has said that this is best viewed as a risk management challenge. Economic analysts and a variety of think tanks are clear. Taking action now is far less expensive than waiting. For example, the estimates of the Alberta government on the costs of dealing with the flooding in 
in uh, the Calgary area and southern Alberta kept climbing. They are now over $6 billion as a result of one catastrophic weather event. Honourable Speaker, it is time for clear plans. It is time for honest plans. This is not something that can be left to a future generation. It's not something that will be fixed in five years, 10 years, or 20 years if we do nothing now. We need a climate action plan. We need leadership from the federal government and from the provincial government and all of us here in this chamber, because individual actions are not enough. We need a commitment to a climate action plan that we will follow through. We need to meet the legislated targets which we have set for greenhouse gas emission reduction. And, Honourable Speaker, we are on target to miss those legislated targets. As we develop resources, we need to add value. And as we develop resources that involve greenhouse gas emissions, we have to clearly say where we will find the offsetting reductions elsewhere in our economy, elsewhere in our community, because we have a responsibility to ourselves and to others around the world to do that. But it's not just a matter of preventing catastrophe. It's a matter of seizing the economic opportunities that are to be found in transit, in retrofits, in clean technology, and in energy. The latest news means that now is not the time to turn back. We want jobs for families today, but we want jobs for the future, and we want hope, not fear. An environmental deficit, honourable speaker, just like a financial deficit, cannot be left to future generations, and an environmental deficit of the nature that the UN has told us about can never be repaid. Thank you. Thank you, member. <laughs> member for Park Seoul Qualicum. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. Like other British Columbians, I am extremely proud of the leadership that this government has demonstrated on climate action. Under the direction of this government, our province has earned international recognition for both our leadership in the green economy and our commitment to protecting our environment. Climate change is affecting every part of the world, and BC is not immune. It's clear that governments at every level must make commitments and take action to address climate issues. Our government is doing just that, and we're doing it very well. For our government, it's not just simple messaging. In BC, we don't just talk the talk about climate change. We take action and prove that it is possible to protect the environment while growing the economy. We do have hope. We are committed to building our record of reducing our carbon footprint and keeping our environment clean. We have taken concrete leadership on climate action, saving energy costs for the provincial public sector, and encouraging investment in emission reduction projects that are driving the creation of low carbon economy. British Columbia is committing to reducing our carbon emissions by 33% by 2020 and by 80% by 2050. Ours is the first jurisdiction in all of North America to have a carbon neutral public sector. In 2007, the province and union of BC municipalities established the voluntary BC Community Climate Action Charter. 90% of BC communities have signed on to this this charter, proving just how important climate action is to British Columbians. To achieve carbon neutrality, municipalities invest in greenhouse gas reduction projects in their communities and purchase offsets. The province supports their efforts by returning 100% of carbon tax dollars to charter communities. The member from Delta just told me that his community will be receiving more than $212,000 for his community. It is clear that the revenue neutral carbon tax has created positive change for our communities. We are taking action not only to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and provide incentives to develop cleaner technology, but to establish our province's role as a leader in the development of new green economy. The more we create opportunities for people to live more environmentally friendly lifestyles, the better off we will all be. This leadership also guides the development of BC's liquefied natural gas industry. Our government right now is working to ensure that BC's LNG operations are the cleanest in the world. 
Discussions are taking place with industry right now to make this a reality. Honorable Speaker, climate change is a global issue. By exporting natu natural gas, BC will supply growing markets with the cleanest burning fossil fuel. LNG is the biggest opportunity for BC to help reduce global greenhouse gas emissions by helping countries like China reduce coal-fired power generation with natural gas. Did you know that to match just one year of China's proposed emissions reduction, BC would have to shut everything down, every car, every school, every factory and hospital for at least a year and a half. We can grow our economy and we can do it responsibly. The Premier has been clear that BC will remain a climate action leader. The BC Jobs Plan reiterates the leadership position reaffirming that climate action policies are the driver of innovation and economic outcomes. On October 28, 2013, the Premier and Governors from Pacific Coast Collaborative Partner States signed the West Coast Action Plan on Climate Action and Clean Energy. It reinforces BC's commitment to clean energy and clean economy initiatives as well as committing Washington State and Oregon to adopt carbon pricing policies that align with existing mechanisms in BC and California. Honorable Speaker, climate change is such a global issue that requires action at every level, from small town neighborhoods to international trade. Moving forward, our government will continue to work with the province's families, businesses, and community leaders on environmental goals that will benefit our environment, our economy, and our world. Thank you, Member. <laughs> member for Vancouver Fairview. Thank you, Honourable Speaker, and thank you to the Member from Parksville Qualicum uh, for her remarks and for her, uh, her caring about the issue of climate change. But let me simply say that the 772 scientists who wrote and edited the UN report on climate change have made it clear that world leaders have only a few years left to reduce carbon emissions enough to avoid leading to massive global warming, catastrophic global warming that will be felt everywhere in the world, including here in British Columbia. Let me say, Honourable Speaker, that uh, I will acknowledge that a number of steps were taken a number of years ago by the Liberal government to, uh, to uh, deal with climate, to initiate a climate action plan, to introduce a carbon tax a leading model carbon tax, but let me also say that since that time we simply have not seen enough commitment to follow through and in this latest iteration uh, of the government climate change seems to have been reduced to words and not action. We have seen no meaningful new climate action tabled since 2008. As for uh, reductions that are planned, uh, to meet under the uh, Emission Reduction Target Act, the Globe and Mail last December said no one believes BC will meet the target of cutting its greenhouse gas emissions 33 per cent by 2020. A BC government report has indicated it expects a robust LNG industry could at least double the BC's GHG emissions. That's the government's own report. So I will reiterate, Honourable Speaker, that as we develop a gas industry or any industry that involves significant GHD emissions, we need to plan for GHD G reductions in other parts of our society and industry. Honourable Speaker, it may well be true that if coal-fired plants in China are replaced by natural gas, liquefied natural gas-fired plants, that there will be an overall reduction in GHG emissions. But where, Honourable Speaker, is there a commitment from the government to tie the export of LNG to a reduction in the use of coal, to a substitution of LNG for coal. Honourable Speaker, we can grow the economy through developing resources. As long as we account for GHG reductions, we can also contribute to GHG reductions and build the economy by investing now in transit, in energy conservation, in energy retrofits across the residential and commercial sectors. We need to ensure that our children will look back and not condemn us for ignoring this challenge, but thank us because we heeded science, took action, and safeguarded their future just as we looked after our well-being today.